So uh, this is um, my joke title. Uh, nobody talks about negative results, although I do love how this uh, forum is pretty good about reporting negative results. Um, so I think it's going to get about 30% Rotten Tomatoes, and uh, it's organized into four completely fruitless sections. Uh, hopefully you'll enjoy them. So the first one is, of course, why, why do I care about parallel and time for these kinds of problems? Um, it's generally around the, the scientific goals merged with the computer architecture trends. So I thought that would basically be setting up disappointment. That'd be a good way to talk about it. Um, I think pitfalls for higher order implicit wave equation. We talk a little bit about implicitness. Um, a lot of people treat wave equations with explicit methods. And so I think this is basically about me struggling with the past and trying to uh, show how you can do very good higher order implicit uh, wave equation solutions. Um, I have a lot of half-baked ideas, which is good. We can talk about those. So that's basically my cry for help, knowing that uh, either disappointment or betrayal will follow. And then finally, I've got some trivial test problems. Maybe there is a little opportunity there. And that's kind of my, uh, my statement of humility and hoping that maybe somebody will reach out and help me with this problem. So that's, that's the outline. Um, so here's the real application. So I am working with uh, electromagnetic, uh, micromagnetic uh, um, uh, applications. In particular, um, sorry, I lost my mouse for some reason. There we go. Uh, they look like this when laid out. So you, you, you lay out a microelectronic thing that has basically a, a flattened out coil and you're solving Maxwell's equations. So classic electromagnetism on the whole domain, but you have lots of material jumps across these different materials. And so generally when you treat these explicitly, your, your CFL condition um, or even implicitly for the purposes of calculating accuracy is based on the speed of light, which as we all know is pretty fast. Um, in the, this orange yellow region here, there's actually a uh, different nonlinear effect. So uh, the typical approaches people take to, to EM are to kind of you know, take Fourier modes or do, do it in frequency domain. Well, you can't do that here because the nonlinear effects uh, prevent you from doing that transform without a lot of extra work. So these are the LLG equations. They're for micro um, uh, magnetic effects uh, associated with uh, spin torque and things like that. And, and they actually, in this particular design, use this effect uh, in order to uh, shape and uh, manage the resonance of the signal that's going through this particular device. Um, so in cross-section, it's a fairly complex geometry layered on top of various parts of a chip, and uh, it's integrated in general. And you know, classically, people attack these complex geometries with finite element methods. Um, here's a picture of a mesh down below. And you can see this mesh is very anisotropic. It's got um, this is not a particularly great mesh, but if you're going to do uh, classic tetrahedral elements, you get spread out quite a bit in terms of uh, following the contours exactly if you want good resolution for the edges of your domain, since that's a design optimization goal. But you also have a, a hugely anisotropic domain. This, that picture actually is not particularly good at uh, showing the anisotropy, but it's greater, it's usually 10 to even 100 in some cases in aspect ratio on these layers. So very large horizontal domains because it's a chip, very thin layers because it's an etching or deposition process. And so those two things together mean that if you go with an explicit method, for those of you that are familiar with anisotropic problems, you end up being extremely and severely confined by the speed of light CFL constraint in the vertical direction. So, um, so uh, classically, people do what's called a finite difference time domain method for these. There's a Yee grid, which is just a classic staggered discretization. And you do this so that you get uh, kind of no two delta x instabilities associated with it. So it's nice because it's easy. Uh, it's an explicit time integration. Your CFL condition dictates the same time step everywhere. So that can be painful, but you can use adaptive mesh refinement to get around that. And also um, the CFL condition is to some extent expressing your, your um, wave resolution accuracy as well. So that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but it is staggered in space and time. And if you look at the, the way it's applied to these complex geometries, the, the material properties tend to be smeared out over this E grid in order to um, kind of represent the material jumps. And what happens as a result of that is that you end up with these, at low resolutions especially, you end up with these effects that are not great, um, which don't really represent the nature of the sharp material boundaries. Um, it's definitely more difficult to do mesh refinement and dealing with this anisotropic issue in electronics. And if you look at the performance of these, they're often memory bandwidth bound, um, especially on GPUs. That means you're wasting, you know, 99% of the GPU's capabilities because these are simple, finite difference, explicit updates. 
Uh, the arithmetic intensity, for those of you that know what that is, is much less than one. So that's that's even worse than a sparse matrix in a lot of cases. Um, and there are ways of coupling these things together, but this particular approach of doing um, uh, explicit Yi grid, you're best at best you're going to get second order accuracy in time, and it's a serial integration. It's um, basically you, you can't split it up into parallel in time in the easiest way unless you apply mechanisms like uh, we've been talking about with with M grid and Parareal and others. So what what I've been working on is a different version of this. It's called uh, cut cells. And cut cells represent the domain in a way that you, you cut out these sharp material boundaries through the domain. Uh, I treat Maxwell's equations um, uh, strictly as a you know, curl curl system, basically. And this um, is then treated with an alternating direction implicit approach, ADI. So what's nice about that is that even with the anisotropy, anisotropy it is a unconditionally stable method. But because um, I have this six way splitting between the two variables E and B and the three dimensions of each of the curl operators, um, you get, uh, if you're gonna do splitting in the simplest way, you get first order accuracy. Uh, and it's very dependent on the solution gradients, which again, with these material jumps tend to be fairly steep if you have a big jump in the material property, just based on uh, physical arguments. Um, and uh, in general, you know, it's unconditionally stable, but you have this issue with splitting introducing to poor time accuracy. Uh, so is it worth the work? Well, the work actually on a GPU isn't that much more to do this full, um, what's called a line solve or a, a dimensionally split implicit solve. Um, many libraries are out there for dealing with them. They can do them in batch. Batch in this case means that if I'm taking a slice across the grid in the I direction, I can solve every one of those I directions at the same time. And banded solves are available in the um, NVIDIA Kublas libraries or in Intel's math kernel libraries, and they're even available on the newer um, HIP AMD libraries too. So this is something that you can speed up quite a bit and do in parallel there. And then second of all, um, with the Yi grid, you end up with all of these staggered things in space and time, so it's a lot more complicated. Um, and one of the questions that I came to this with was, you know, we, uh, in this community, we've talked about things like FAST method, uh, Mike Minion's work um, with others uh, on taking spectral deferred corrections to speed up. So I'll talk about that. And the other thing is, instead of the simple staggered uh, second order differencing, we can do much higher order stencils and get better accuracy as a result. And that gives us, uh, on top of that, opportunities for doing parallel computation in both space, so line solves, and in components and direction, which would be, in this case, a factor of six. Uh, because we have six different component directions, and then uh, time as well, uh, which of course is the theme of everything here. So I, I just wanted to give you uh, a view of what this, this thing looks like when it's calculated with cut cells. So the little jagged lines on this are basically the grid line intersections kind of showing at a fairly coarse resolution what the shape looks like, but they are sharp interfaces, right? This um, this allows you, in the, and the vertical direction in this case is uh, shown at a scale of 100 times what it actually is, because again, these are kind of etching and deposition processes, so that anisotropy is really painful. Um, so then um, resolving the shorter wavelengths, and this is two. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, people mentioned earlier, uh, I know uh, Jacob mentioned it, like if you're looking at advection and implicit solvers, for example, um, you wanna take big time steps and but the problem is, is CFL is both a stability and an accuracy constraint, right? Um, I didn't do a good job of explaining this here because I'm trying to rush a bit, but this alpha is basically in the middle of this is a tiny cut cell you wouldn't even notice. And typically um, uh, alpha equals one means that that cut cell is actually close to a full size or is a full size. And if you take 55 steps for this uh, wave to uh, go around its periodic domain, it started off as a square wave, and we know that with an explicit uh, upwind method, you end up with a lot of dissipation for first order upwind uh, and forward Euler. So if you look at an implicit version of that and try to double the CFL, well, you get the, the small cell stability for free. Um, that's a different talk that I can give some time if you're interested, but um, and you take half as many steps because the CFL is much bigger, but the dissipation is painful, super painful. And I think, um, in fact, I saw earlier a similar plot to this, but you know, ideally, uh, infection wave equation, all of your eigenvalues, even with your time integrator, are sitting on the inner circle and they just rotate around and that reflects kind of the, the waves propagating in space time, keeping their shape. Well, CFL of 0.9, we're already ruining that for most of the modes. Uh, 1.8, 4, a CFL of 4, 
99% in this discrete case are actually being damped out so rapidly that you're really only resolving one or two or three wave modes. In fact, this mode here is the constant mode, right? So you really can't get much else except constants correct at large CFLs for implicit methods. So uh, the rest of this talk is a little bit of an exploration as to why. Um, so first of all, um, I wanna do parallel and time here. So what would be that combination of parallel and time plus adaptive mesh refinement for these really sharp material interfaces? I can also do adaptive mesh refinement to try to deal with that vertical anisotropy in a much bigger domain as well, for example. Um, so I wanna control accuracy and um, I wanna be able to move fine grids uh, in parallel with coarse grids. I'd like to minimize synchronization in serial sections because um, in general, the bandwidth on modern GPUs and other architectures is what's limiting the, the speed of things. So you want to be able to just use as many flops as you can for accuracy and not move any additional data. Um, so if I'm hallucinating, why not keep going here, right? So one of the things that I was great that uh, happy that um, Tommaso talked about this was that if you use FFTs and exponential integrators, you get a lot of this for free. Now, of course, I can't, right? It, it's good in that it's exact for linear problems. Uh, the exponential integrators don't have any CFL constraints, and um, you know if you're careful about how you do this, you can use FFTs and other things to get your n log n type solvers, and they fit naturally into uh, um, kind of uh, parallel and time kind of frameworks. Unfortunately, I can't use those because they're not for uh, they're just for linear problems, and the material jumps mess everything up. Even for the, the uh, linear problems with variable coefficients. Um, you end up with a lot of aliasing issues when you do something like uh, Ewald summation on an AMR mesh, which is something that I have to use. I have to use AMR. What this picture here is showing is that right here at the edges, you want to refine around the material boundaries to reduce the amount of error associated with jumps in the solutions, for example. Um, and uh, one of the things that's kind of a dirty little secret is FFT really doesn't scale well at all. If you try to take it um, off one node, there was a, a report by uh, Jack Dungara at um, at uh, Oak Ridge that was showing that it's 99% communication bound in 3D. Uh, and that's really not a great way to try to scale up a method. Um, and of course, the, my point around nonlinear is an issue too. <clears throat> so um, I, I'm really, I, I try to invent things, but honestly, I'm much better at integrating them. So just accepting that is probably a, a, a good uh, acknowledgement that I'm a master of none, but I do try to be a jack of all trades. So, um, so this ADI scheme, uh, they've been used for a long time in these in these finite difference time domain electromagnetics problems. Um, and just to explain it, these ADI solves are, are tridiagonal. And as I mentioned, you can do, use iterative and direct solvers on them. There's even something with GPUs called tensor cores now, which are low precision, iterative. Um, uh, they're, they're a good uh, kind of kernel to use for an iterative uh, solver method, and they even have them for tridiagonal methods. Um, so it's we were able to show very good speed up using tensor cores on the, the latest uh, NVIDIA GPUs, for example. And one of the things about these um, is that the string splitting, if people know what that is, that's when you do this multiplicative uh, X direction, then Y direction, then Z direction, and then reverse it uh, across the two sets of, of uh, E field and B field variables in the Maxwell's equations. So the space time errors are really intermixed, but you can get it up to second order accuracy, but the errors are proportional to the gradients. So that's really painful. So if you use that multiplicative splitting, it's also serial, right? You can't actually split it out into different directions. Whereas if you use an additive splitting, you actually can get uh, straight up a 6x speed up, but you end up with a first order method. So you, know, you might ask, how can we improve the errors um, of such a low order time integrator? And I think all of you know that spectral deferred corrections is a great option for that. Um, so SDC uh, makes sweeps through our um, using a low order method that's actually taking steps uh, on collocation points for some fully implicit uh, rhombic cut scheme. And if you take enough sweeps through, you'll actually converge uh, to round off to the, to the fully implicit RK scheme. So um, one of the things that, that you can show with the, the, the spectral deferred corrections iteration is that uh, each pass uh, improves the order of accuracy of your estimate by uh, one order of delta T. And if you did something like choose the Radau 2A nodes, those uh, don't include the initial uh, node of the interval, but only um, uh, the, the last uh, points of the quadrature. They are L-stable, 
And they are also A-stable, which for a wave equation with no dissipation, um, as some of us have been talking about, is, is a big challenge. So for example, I can do a compact implicit derivative, which is, again, a whole other talk, but basically something you can um, use in this line solve to get high order accuracy in space. I pick a Radau scheme that has three stages, so three collocation points, which gives me fifth order in time. So together, I can get fifth order in space and time in conjunction with a six times parallelism in the splitting. Now, granted, the issue is that, um, oh, sorry, I, and I get I get a stability for that for free, although it's not clear necessarily, and if somebody has um, um, experience on this, I'd love to hear how many iterations of SDC sweeps you have to make in order to guarantee that your stability region is asymptotically close to the um, implicit Runge-Kutta schemes region. I think that'd be a very good um, uh, discussion to have with respect to the efficiency of these methods. Um, and then on top of this kind of thing, uh, I know uh, Mike Minion's uh, been working for a long time on the FAST algorithm. He's really kind and, and uh, offered to um, help me integrate it here. I haven't done that yet, uh, but there are other options too, like using Parallel or MGRIP to get parallelism and time on this. Um, so the two questions I have is, uh, for SDC especially, why do we only get these order delta T improvements on each sweep? I know conceptually, of course, you're updating a quadrature rule associated with um, the, the kind of time integral, but uh, it seems like we go through a lot of work in order to get just that small increment order of accuracy. And in general, the, the number of iterations you need to converge to the implicit runge kutta scheme for these wave equation problems seems to be much higher than the order of the method that you're trying to go to. So a question, is there a, st a stability trade-off for that? For example, um, you know, a lot of these ADI methods look like backward Euler applied successively in order to do these sweeps. So what happens if I truncate it early? It should still be A-stable, but I haven't been able to do the math on that yet. So that's one set of questions for the community I'd love some help with. Um, another example here. So, uh, so this aspect ratio leads to a large CFL in the vertical direction. What can I do to get good accuracy and high CFL for something that would be fairly high in the frequency range? So the example that I just showed you, which was ADI splitting using spectral deferred, spectral deferred corrections with nine collocation points, which is a lot of iterations and a lot of solves, you do get 17th order accuracy. And in space, I have to use a, um, a compact implicit scheme that is very high order, but it is a banded solve. It is completely parallelizable in the 6x way. And I get very nice accuracy properties for wavelengths of uh, you know, pi over four, which is, uh, what is that, eight delta x, right? So that's um, that's a lot to ask, but 10 to the minus third accuracy for engineering problems is fantastic. That's, you almost never see that. So that's one approach for this kind of thing. So the second approach is uh, that I wanted to talk about were around extrapolation methods. Um, uh, I did at the last parallel and time conference talk about this. I made a little progress here, but not much. Um, what they are is a way of taking something simple like a backward Euler or a Frank Nicholson or other scheme and then doing parallel iterations in time. So this is an example from David Ketchison's paper a while back, which showed that for an explicit method, so for example, backward Euler would take one big time step here. Um, the second extrapolation would take half time steps to the endpoint, then third time steps and fourth time steps. And you can show that if you can do these in parallel, for example, the processor one would have five solves, processor two would also have five solves to do, all at the same resolution, et cetera. You can get a certain level of parallelism out of this thing as you do more and more extrapolations. And since I'm talking about a 17th order method, you can imagine that this might be beneficial to do more and more of these in parallel. Um, so then the, the issue with these though, is that um, you can't really get very far with wave equation. Um, you know, backward Euler, for example, uh, if that's the basis of your extrapolation method here, uh, you can't get A-stable and higher order. Um, by the time you get to your third extrapolation, which would be this one right here, ignoring the, the four-point extrapolation, then you've lost your A-stability. And in fact, um, you can show that it's a weird instability. You, you lose stability for low wave numbers and high wave numbers. All you can get is just the middle wave numbers. So it's really a, a kind of obnoxious way. You're so close, right? Look at that. It's like only, only probably one one thousandth off from a stability, but it doesn't matter. It will blow up if your uh, system has any frequency response in that in that region. So from an extrapolation method standpoint, uh, working that into this ADI finite difference time domain scheme 
Um, you can write it out uh, in terms of the linear stability analysis, and it's just uh, you know a rational um, extrapolation, and you're combining different size time steps. So each of these methods, R sub m, represents our sub time step uh, splittings. And then you do some linear combination of them that happens to cancel all the error terms. And, you know, for example, for the backward Euler, um, simple one, two, three, four sequence, each of these terms looks like, you know, four steps, for example, for four subdivisions. And each of those steps is one quarter the size. So it's very easy to write this out. And you can show that this matches the pod A expansion for, for the exponential, which of course in the linear case would be exact. And you can match the pot A expansion terms up to some order M uh, accuracy to get, uh, or sorry, order M plus one terms to get order M accuracy there. So this is all straightforward uh, implicit error analysis. But the A stability part's the tough part because, um, you know, I, just ignoring the whole rest of the complex plane, you know, assuming that if your method is stable for most of its substeps and maybe it'll be stable for um, the whole left half of the plane if you can get the imaginary access to be stable. So for that A-stability, of course, we know the constraint there is that the, the amplifi amplification factor has to be less than or equal to one. Um, and we know that this actually has to be uh, exactly one for the origin so that this is this difference of denominator and numerator. And remember, the numerator for this extrapolation method is the only place where the, um, uh, the coefficients or mixing come into play. So uh, you can show this is a, a necessary requirement for it to be A-stable. And it turns out that it, with some manipulation, this is basically a, a bilinear form on those coefficients. And so you have some expansion in terms of uh, K terms of powers of omega, omega being the frequency that you're tracking on the imaginary axis. And because it's real, you can just check positive values. And then you have this strange sum here, which is a kind of a bilinear form on each of the coefficients. And now you're asking about what properties of A, right? Because this A here is no longer a function of my coefficient. So I have to find the coefficient such that this is always true. And boy, did I go down a rat hole here. This was actually um, a version of Hilbert's classic problem called the sum of squares representation of a polynomial. I don't know if any of you know that. It's uh, Luckily, it's easy in 1D, which is just the one dimension of omega. If I made it 2D in the sense of uh, into the complex plane, I think that it's an open question as to how one would solve this for higher D. It's an NP hard problem in that case, I believe. Uh, anyway, so you can basically turn this equation into something that is this, which is can I find some symmetric positive definite Q, which corresponds to what's inside of here, such that um, all of my powers of omega line up nicely and they uh, look like a sum of uh, terms that are sum of terms that are squares themselves, therefore guaranteeing that they're always greater than or equal to zero. So how far did I get with this? Not far at all. I was able to show that potentially you can trade off the extrapolation accuracy, which, which historically is very strict, saying you have four terms, you cancel them this way. You can throw away some accuracy, so like maybe take four terms and drop them to third accuracy, and improve a stability, but I've not been able to nail it yet as to why or how. Maybe it's maybe it's an uh, order stability barrier kind of thing. And then the second thing is, if you looked at that first pass on the backward Euler um, solver, uh, you do ten solves, which that's a lot of expense. You can get some parallelism out of it, but you only get fourth order accuracy. So why can't we get higher order accuracy out of that? So again, open to the community. If anybody wants to work with me on this, I have lots of examples of, of why or how this may or may not work. And then, um, so uh, uh, something that I've also been looking at, actually as a result of um, David Seal's talks uh, at the Parallel and Time conferences. So I, again, great community and love the collaboration. Um, you can do a multi-moment style um, solver. So if you have an implicit solver, typically you're going to use a Jacobian if it's nonlinear in order to, um, find uh, your solution. Well, why aren't we using our Jacobians actually to improve the time accuracy as well? Because once you have that, you can show that that's just the next term in the Taylor series expansion in time. So that sometimes gets called multi-moment or this other term here, implicit Hermite. So if I take a, a seventh order upwind method, which is a little bit easier and, and um, uh, kind of the, the, tri, uh, the tridiagonal bands are a little tighter. And I do one step of extrapolation with it. So it's officially eighth order. I can get all the way up to a CFL of four, which isn't my goal of 10 or 16 or 100, but you can see that mostly this is phase error. That's the dashed line. 
Um, and so if I wanted uh, 10 to the third accuracy, I could actually get above that eight to the XM mode again for CFL four. So I'm still playing around with this. Um, if I do one more extrapolation, it's completely unstable unless I somehow tune, uh, much like everybody's to, uh, been talking about, the dissipation to match the time integrator. So I, I think that there's a lot of uh, stuff to do there. So that's all I had. Hopefully it leaves a little bit of time for questions. I want to thank you. And um, if anyone wants to clean up my script and help me with the finale, let me know.